try and be uh, brief, and in that sense, perhaps um, just a little schematic today, and, and perhaps we can work out some of that schema in discussion uh, afterwards. Um, the theme for the, the afternoon session, uh, if I understood correctly, uh, was uh, a sort of reflection on uh, meditation and how that helps us to really understand consciousness better. And then how might um, this understanding of meditation contribute to cognitive science? some way. Um, because of my background, uh, I'm going to concentrate much more on the first question uh, that was posed for us. And, and, um, the second question, I think, really gets into a uh, fascinating, it's a wonderful question, uh, sort of fascinating aspects around this development of what's called neural phenomenology, um, which is basically taking some of the insights from phenomenology philosophical approach developed more than a hundred years ago, taking some of uh, the insights that have been gained through this philosophical approach and um, applying them or using them or, or using those insights to motivate certain projects in cognitive science. And so these are questions about, um, this is I think what neural phenomenology aims at. I don't work directly in neural phenomenology. I'm, I'm more what most people would call a pure phenomenologist. Um, how, how pure is uh, something that even Husserl uh, has to answer for? But um, uh, I do think that this second question, this methodological question, is extremely interesting. So, so much work is done basically taking the insights from someone like Husserl, from someone like Heidegger, or some, from someone like Rilo Ponty, and applying them or seeing what they might lead to in terms of um, cognitive science research projects. So, I mean, a, a kind of simple example of this is recently there's been a lot of talk about uh, intersubjectivity and mirror neurons. And so one of the basic ideas here is that long, long before people understood anything about mirror neurons, phenomenologists were talking about the fundamentally intersubjective construction uh, of human existence. Okay. And so that somehow projects in more cognitive science and neuroscience recently, in a, in a certain sense, are used to confirm, well, this is the big methodological question, confirm um, or at least add a certain new perspective on this basic phenomenological insight. And I think this is the kind of methodological question that the second aspect of this afternoon question uh, is supposed to, to aim at. And you know, look, you can have a lot of debate about that. You know, so one of the one of the things is really what counts as an explanation, what counts as uh, in, in science or in philosophy. So part of the tension I think around neural phenomenology is that uh, neuroscientists tend to say. Oh yeah, that's right. Husserl knew something about intersubjectivity, you know, and now we know why he knew something about it. And I mean, it's a sort of reductionistic approach, right? So that you you come back to some sort of account of uh, basic human phenomena in terms of basic terms of um, neural networks or something of that nature. And Husserl, Heidegger, and Merleau-Ponty phenomenology in general would re would resist that. So these are, these are interesting questions around how the insights of phenomenology actually then play out in cognitive science or in, in harder um, neuroscience. But since I don't really know too much about neuroscience, um, I'm going to leave that to you to see if anything I say today has any sort of uh, impact, perhaps suggesting certain avenues, as I would say, of uh, a research agenda for um, cognitive science and for neuroscience. I am uh, you know, much more um, a phenomenologist. Uh, so I, I, I work, I'm professionally categorized as a phenomenologist, not things in academic life. Um, and I'm interested primarily in Husserl and Heidegger, um, but also the later phenomenological uh, tradition. And I think 
uh, one of the reasons I'm so interested in your topic today is that basically phenomenology is about consciousness. So based from Husserl onwards, I think you can make the argument that this is what the phenomenological tradition in philosophy is about. It's about consciousness and about the characteristics and the structure of consciousness. Husserl really you know, says this uh, in a very clear, clear language. Husserl's phenomenology is about a science of consciousness. And what he exactly means by consciousness, he works out in all of his books. But it turns out that he means something relatively broad by consciousness. And this becomes even more so the case in someone like Heidegger. And um, one of the debates within the phenomenological tradition, within this tradition of 20th century philosophy, is exactly how far you can stretch this term consciousness. So you know, some people would argue, well, Heidegger is already a big break with someone like Husserl. Why? Because Husserl says that precisely philosophy should be a philosophy of consciousness. But consciousness is too narrow a term for someone like Heidegger. Philosophy should be about human existence. It should focus on human existence. And consciousness, at least, Terminologically, sometimes seems to just corner, um, cut off a little piece of human existence. There's much more to human existence than consciousness. I think this is kind of a pedantic terminological discussion. So people say, you know, end of science of consciousness with Heidegger, you know, onwards with you know, existential phenomenology, something like, something like that. And then even more, more, more so with someone like talks about perception, but what, what Merleau-Ponty would mean by consciousness is something like completely embodied perception. So introducing this extremely rich notion of the body, and that seems to be in contradistinction to Husserl's rather epistemological, knowledge-based understanding of consciousness. I, get, I, think, I think these categorizations are sometimes a little too strict. They don't read Husserl tentatively enough to see that he has a very broad and also an embodied notion of consciousness. He's not just thinking about conscious thought, as we might tend to in philosophy. And I think the same is true of Heidegger and Merleau-Ponty. So in a certain sense, I think I was invited today <laughs> to defend myself being here, um, is, is that phenomenology is really just about consciousness. It is a conversation about con consciousness from different perspectives and emphasizing different aspects about what Husserl calls this wonder of wonders. This is what a phrase that he has in his later work. Wonders of wonders, Nossa, consciousness, in all of its uh, manifold uh, complexity. So this is, this is what I'm going to uh, focus on um, today. I am, I am a bit of an itinerant philosopher. As I said, I spend, I spend a lot of time in Asia. Uh, and so uh, with some of the colleagues who have organized the conference, we've talked about kind of cross-cultural phenomenology and, and different pra practices in different cultures around some of these themes that uh, interest us. And so I think this was maybe one, uh, one reason I was uh, also uh, kindly invited uh, today. But we have much greater es uh, experts in these fields uh, coming later uh, in the day. Um, so I'm going to strictly stick rather closely to something I feel a little more comfortable with, and that's hardcore Heidegger. Okay? So, so get ready uh, get ready for a little German, uh, but not too much, uh, I hope. Okay? So I entitled my talk, and when I was thinking about the title for my talk today, and what I want to emphasize about Heidegger's phenomenology of consciousness, I entitled my talk, uh, Listening for Silence. Meditation in everyday life. Okay. So this is the kind of uh, theme, as Heidegger said, light found, clue uh, to my talk today. Listening for silence. Okay, um, Heidegger, German philosopher. Very complex. Very technical in some ways. Um, known to be a, a 
particularly difficult writer to penetrate uh, into. Um, what does this have to do with meditative practice? What does, what does reading Heidegger and what does Heidegger have to say about meditative practice? Well, actually quite a bit, <laughs> quite a bit. So in the light, later Heidegger, in, in, in the writings from towards the end of his philosophical career, you get some very key notions about what it is to really be human, and what it is to really enter into oneself in a particular way. And a couple of these notions are, are, are very, I think, um, related to what we would normally call meditative practice. One of them is Gelassenheit. So um, Heidegger has this term in his later thought, Gelassenheit. Very difficult term to translate into uh, English. But I think it means something like letting go. You know? It's a way to become a subject through letting go of one subject. And I think we, we know well that this is a mark of much meditative practice. It's that, that part, of, part of meditation is a way of becoming a self through letting go of the type of self that constitutes our normal selfhood. Um, our normal, what in phenomenological terms we would call egoological selfhood uh, of everyday life. Of letting go of a particular type of I um, in order to receive discover or uncover in Heideggerian language another type of I. So Heidegger, in fact, says quite a bit about this, um, this notion of Galassian as really being equivalent to true philosophy. So in some ways, his definition of philosophy and phenomenology morphs in his later thought into um, meditation in a particular way. And he captures that with another word, uh, bizinum. Bizinum. So, so at least you'll take home two. I always say this with, with my students. You know, whatever you get out of phenomenology class, you get a little German vocabulary. You know, you can impress your <coughs> friends later on appropriate stages in conversation. So two words to take home, Gelassenheit, you know, let letting go. You know. So if someone's really giving you a hard time, just say, come on, you know, give it a little Gelassenheit. <laughs> and so on. And, and another term you can take home is this bizinum. bizinum. And bizinum is usually translated into uh, English as something like contemplative thought. Contemplative thought. And in the later Heidegger, uh, bizinum gets worked out uh, a little bit more clearly than Glassenheit, really, uh, because it's, it's worked out in contrast to what Heidegger calls calculative. So he thinks that there's a tradition, and most of philosophy, he claims, from you know, at least Aristotle onwards, maybe even in the pre-Socratics, um, has this orientation towards some sort of calculative thought. Calculation becomes key. And so the role of calculation in our modern technological society is something that was born a long time ago in a particular orientation in Greek philosophy. When exactly there are debates among where Heidegger pinpoints this is different times of, in different texts. You know, sometimes he blames you know, Aristotle, Plato's okay. And other times he blames it's already Plato. And then as I say, sometimes it's already the pre-Socratics. And in this strange way in which Heidegger thinks, he sometimes says it's even the pre-pre-Socratics. You know, so it's it's something that belongs to thought itself to have this tendency towards calculation, towards objectification, towards technologization. This is something that belongs to the way we actually think. But it can, it can cover up this other aspect of thought, which is this meditative uh, component, this bizinness denken, bizinum, which is, in fact, for Heidegger, the mark of genuine philosophy, or authentic uh, philosophy. So these are two very uh, important notions in the later Heidegger that I think are, are relevant for the discussions today. But how do you work this out systematically? You know, what, do you, what can you say you know, about these, these two important um, terms? Um, the later Heidegger is very difficult. 
And it's very hard for me to say something about the later Heidegger without saying something about the early Heidegger. So I mean, as a dean of philosopher's work, I have this is always, well, you can't understand this if you don't understand that. And you can't, um, and usually that's true, unfortunately. So it means you have to go back and do a little homework on the early Heidegger. So I actually thought, for the sake of simplicity, um, I would focus on the early Heidegger, but with the kind of clues of these themes from Heidegger's later work that I was trying to introduce. Uh, so thinking about meditation, thinking about um, letting go of a particular type of subjectivity, um, but from the standpoint of the early Heidegger. Where do you find something about meditative practice in the early Heidegger? Where do you look for that? That was a little bit more of a challenge. You know, these, these later terms really need them. In the early Heidegger, in his um, descriptive analysis of human existence, um, you don't exactly immediately find you know, something so um, so close to the theme of today's conference or the theme of um, the question set for this afternoon. Uh, but of course, if you're a good phenomenologist, you can find anything anywhere. And, um, so thinking about the thinking about the the early Heidegger. And thinking about what meditative practice in general, I think, this, this could be an interesting question for today, um, seems to aim at or has at least as a component is silence. Right? So there's something about the role of silence in contemplative thought, something about the role of silence that's important. In, I think, you know, there's a claim I'll make, but please counter it. In, in meditative practice, silence. And so this led me to think about, OK, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just talk a little bit about silence, as contradictory as it sounds. I'm going to talk a little bit about silence. But you'll see it's less contradictory than you think it sounds uh, in the early Heidegger. So what does the early Heidegger say about silence? What does the early Heidegger say about silence? Heidegger says, that silence is a form of authentic discourse. So silence is a way of speaking authentically. It's a way of speaking authentically. What does, what does Heidegger mean by that? Well, Heidegger has a view that human beings are fundamentally discursive. So it belongs to the structure of human Dasein, as Heidegger calls it, which is this, this entity that we all are, to discourse. To discourse. Discourse is a structure of who we are. So this is a this is a claim that Heidegger tries to work out and show and give, give evidence for. But uh, Heidegger points out quite clearly that much of human discourse, in a certain sense, is what he calls idle chatter. So that while discourse in German, oh, OK, you have to learn two more words in German. Uh, discourse, this fundamental structure that belongs to every human being is called Rede in German. It usually takes the form of what's called idle chatter, good. Gerede is, you know, isn't this idle chatter? Average everyday discourse, Heidegger would say. And so silence, silence is somehow a way of authentically speaking versus what Heidegger is going to claim is the inauthentic speaking of average everyday life. So let me just try and work that out very, very briefly. So first of all, it's important to say that Heidegger is very clear right away when he says silence is not just not speaking. Okay? So he really does want us to get away from that notion. So he, he really means it when he says silence is a form of authentic human speaking. It's a way of discourse. It's not the withholding of discourse somehow. It's a form. So you can't think about silence as just being quiet. 
something that something else laid out. It's not just a lack of words or a lack of sound from the outside. In fact, as we'll see, there might be no such thing as a lack of words or a lack of sound from the outside. And so he's very quick to clear away that, you know, kind of an average everyday conception we might have if someone says something about the sun. Heidegger would call that an ontic understanding of sun. Just the lack of words, the lack of sound. In some ways. Um, he doesn't mean that. He means it at some sort of what he calls an ontological level, some sort of structure of our very existence. Um, that at the very structure of the, our existence is this aspect of discourse, and that we can discourse in a silent. And I'd like to give two kind of contrasting interpretations of this, just to set up the discussion about silence and hear what you have to say about that. I think there are kind of two dominant readings in the you know, philosophical literature on Heidegger, and in those inspired by Heidegger, about this notion of silence at the ontological level. And the first one I've already alluded to and this is a reading that really contrasts silence and this authentic discoursing with the inauthentic discoursing of everyday life. And this is a reading that, that one gets a lot of in Heidegger. Um, so that somehow, you know, in our average everyday life, we speak in a way that's just chatter, it's empty, it's like small talk, even when it's about very important things. So when Heidegger really wants to get going on the idle chatter, chatter the gereda of everyday life, who does he hit upon? Who is the most full of idle chatter? Well, of course, philosophers. You know, and, and he has tremendously funny jokes about conferences. Um, so you know, let's hope, let's hope he wouldn't joke about ours. You know, and somehow just um, be somehow. Um, a way of, of speaking, perhaps even with very great technical competence, but without any sort of depth. And this is something that, of course, happens in human life and in our professional life quite a bit. That you become very competent at speaking in a way that is, is somehow not even attentive to its own speaking. We become so good at it. You know, and we all, in various aspects of our lives, we become technically competent at speaking speaking broadly understood, in a particular way, where we're just not attentive to what we're actually doing, but we're still good at it. It's like riding a bike. And I think um, this is something Heidegger is aware of. He's very critical of this. But because of this awareness and this criticism, people often then read what I would call this sort of binary approach to Heidegger's understanding of authenticity and that there is kind of this inauthenticity of average everyday life. And then there's this kind of exceptional state, which is authenticity, which maybe I achieve through some form of meditative practice. That, that meditative practice is a form of what phenomenologists would call phenomenological reduction, but a severe form. You rip yourself out of the average everyday. You have to assume different posture than you do in your average everyday life. You assume a different discursive framework. You occupy a different space. These are marks of many meditative practices. And so that somehow meditation is in this way sharply contrasted with everyday life. Um, in this particular Heideggerian reach, okay? I'm not really talking about meditation too much. I'm feeling very nervous uh, <laughs> talking, about, talking about these things. So, um, yeah, meditation is nothing like that. Uh, but, uh, but that's Heidegger. That's Heidegger. Yeah. Uh, so this is this is a particular way of of, of reading of reading Heidegger. Uh, so this, this sharp contrast between the everyday and the exceptional. And so silence then belongs to this kind of exceptional state of authenticity. So 
concerned with missing the one south in a particular way, the blue one south in a particular way. There's a lot of evidence in Heidegger for this type of view. You know, so I mean, people aren't crazy to put it, to put it formally. Uh, he often does. He's so disparaging of this <clears throat> average everyday life in the way of idle chatter. And its tranquilizing nature puts us to sleep. You know, just again, it's so it's so rote, it's so unthoughtful, so uncaring um, that um, you know it just and it, and it's a mark of modernity. You know, it's particularly strong in modernity. So sometimes you get uh, Heidegger does have a slight romantic side. You know, there was less of this idle chatter long ago. <laughs> I don't think that's actually Heidegger's understanding. I don't doubt that's true. But he has a romantic tendency in that this, this kind of idle chatter, this repetitiveness, this, this ability to be replaced by any other speaker um, is something that belongs in particular to the structure of modernity. Um, this is something that's, that I think is very interesting. Heidegger is often considered a bourgeois thinker. He's criticizing idle chatter as a function of modernity. Um, it comes pretty close to Marx. And uh, <coughs> criticism of the replaceability of uh, human labor. Um, this is very much the way we speak in modernity. We all speak the same way. You know, we say, Heidegger would say, what one says, what das man says, what the everyone says. This is the way our language takes on you know, this particular monotone character. And authenticity then is discovering something of one's own voice. And this this is this this is part of this very contrasted approach um, that one can read uh, in Heidegger. So again, I think there's something to think about there. Um, it's something that that um, scholars pick up uh, upon. But I'd actually like to push a, a different reading. <laughs> Just enough time for the real reading, <laughs> the, uh, the, the other, uh, you know, which is there and it's there in the literature and, and so on. And that's, and that's much more that silence belongs in all forms of discourse. So that when we're silent, it's not some sort of exceptional state, but it's some sort of uncovering of that which is already at work in discourse. So it's not something that we create. It's not something, and in fact, that kind of understanding of silence belongs to a particular type of subjectivity. In other words, the silence, well, I have to go out and create silence you know, in order to discover who I am. Um, that actually belongs to a kind of notion of an ideological self that Heidegger's trying to get away with in his later. Know, silence is something. Okay, now it's time to be silent. Or to read this. Um, um, this, I, I think, is, is not what Heidegger is, is aiming at. And there's something about that contrast of reading of authenticity and inauthenticity which suggests that. You have to rip yourself out of the everyday. But I think this other reading is that somehow, you know, silence is, is at work already in everyday discourse. There's always silence. It permeates Discourse. Um, good conversations have moments of silence. You know, we can't all speak at once. You're being very attentive, very kind. Uh, now, um, this is a form of silence, even though someone is talking um, away. And later on, I will do my best to be silent um, as as I try to listen attentively to your to your comments uh, and so on. This is a very uh, different type of reading of silence in the aid of Heidegger. And so it's to suggest that we should not so much be looking for an exceptional state, but we're looking for something within um, our everyday existence and uncovering it. Now, of course, that may take some work. You know, and this is, this is one way to, to understand meditative practice. But again, it's meditative practice not so much as something exceptional to average everyday life, but as perhaps 
some particular form of accessing a type of science that's always at work in the discursive structure of human existence um, that gets covered up. And there's a good reason for that. It's a kind of funny phenomenon, science. It's a kind of negative phenomenon. It's, it's, you know, it's, what, it's, it's a condition of possibility for speaking. It belongs to speaking. But it, of course, it itself is, is, is related to speaking in a, in a very strange way. So sometimes Heideggerians tend to call this type of phenomenon, you know, such as science is, um, a kind of negative possibility. Right? It's a possibility, but it's a negative possibility. It belongs, so it's, it, 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 it is, it's not an absence, it's a presence, but it's a presence in a very particular way. Right? And Part of what meditation is about is understanding how that presence uh, of science is, is already at work. Being attentive to it, learning to be attentive to it, and perhaps, and I think this is always an aspect of Heidegger's thought, you know, fostering it in a way so that perhaps it does have some prescriptive element at the end of the day. It, at least it has some sort of outcome in terms of being more attentive to this aspect of silence perhaps makes us a little less prone to idle chatter. A little, a little less submissive to the idle chatter of everyday um, life. And so there's a way in which maybe these two meetings are not completely at, at, at odds with each other. So that's uh, just a, a few, uh, a few comments that you know the very fascinating theme that. The organizers picked for today's conference. Um, I vastly encourage you to read when looking at the questions, and um, I'm, I'm very open for, for any uh, commentary and, and uh, additions and admonitions uh, that, uh, that you may have. Thank you for your, your kind silence. Thank you.